We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, a new virtual series featuring senior Army leaders that provide important updates on key defense topics. Kicking off today's event is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Association of the United States Army, General Carter Ham. Uh, we look forward to a, a, a great conversation today as we celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and also in preparation of Wednesday's celebration of Women's Equality Day. We've got four great women leaders of the Army to join us in conversation today. Uh, I would encourage you to review the, their full biographies at the upper right-hand part of your screen, but let me briefly introduce our four speakers today. Ms. Kathy Miller is the Administrative Assistant to the Secretary of the Army, and she is the Senior Career Civilian in the Army and the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of the Army for Administrative and Business Matters. Lieutenant General Laura Richardson is the Commanding General of U.S. Army North. Her assignments as a General Officer include Commanding General um, of the U.S. Army Operational Test Command, Deputy Commanding General of the 1st Cavalry Div Division at Fort Hood, Deputy Chief of Staff for the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, in Afghanistan, Chief Army Legislative Liaison, and most recently as Deputy Commanding General, United States Army Forces Command. Lieutenant General Jody Daniels is the Chief of Army Reserve and Commander of the United States Army Reserve Command. She has more than 36 years of active and reserve military service, holds a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics from Carnegie Mellon, a master of science and a PhD in computer, si computer science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And from Fort Knox, joining us, Command Sergeant Major Lenise Thorpe Noel. She is the Command Sergeant Major of Army Human Resources Command. She has almost 31 years of service has earned a master's degree in management and leadership, uh, and has served in a variety of critical assignments in the continental United States, Hawaii, and in Europe. If you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A tab on the lower right-hand side of the screen, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. Before we get to your questions, we'll allow each of our speakers today to make some brief comments on on, on their experience as senior women uh, in the Army, and we'll begin with Smith with Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller, please. Thank you, General Ham. Thank you for that warm welcome and the great introduction, and greetings to my fellow, fellow panelists, uh, General Richardson, General Daniels, and Command Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel. It's an honor to serve on this panel with all of you. My personal journey with the Army started with an overseas assignment as a young spouse of an airman in 1983. While I had an economics degree from Cornell, I wasn't a very good typist and that significantly limited my options uh, for work overseas. Uh, while I eventually found opportunity with the comptroller career field, my first boss, Harold Mannion, he took a chance on me and hired me. And that was the start of a federal career that has allowed me to grow, learn and be a leader not only in finance, but also in logistics, in operations, and now providing a myriad of support services to the Army's headquarters. Along the way, I took advantage of advanced training the Army offered, like the Comptroller course at Syracuse, the National Security Studies Program, and I was a student at the U.S. Army's War College. And I was selected for SES, not inside DOD, but actually in the Department of Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service shortly after graduating from War College. I consider that time away from the Department of Defense my joint assignment, and it was invaluable in learning how other government agencies operate in the federal space. Training, though, is only part of the story. Performance is another aspect. I had to turn my training into useful performance for my organizations and for my teammates. I do have to admit, I am proud of the two presidential rank awards I've received from two different presidents as uh, proof of that performance. Speaking of teammates, teaming, being able to be a trusted and vital teammate is another part of the professional equation. Sometimes being a teammate means leading, and sometimes it means being an active and respectful, respectful follower. 
the soft skills that are often more important than the hard skills of technical knowledge. Our Army looks for competence, character, and commitment. And in the time of COVID, I'd like to add one more C word, and that's compassion. These challenging times ask great leaders to exercise all four as they protect the force, to protect the mission, and protect the nation. In closing, we've become more familiar with the contributions of women in federal service through stories like that of Ms. Katherine Johnson, the NASA mathematician and her colleagues whose stories came to light in the 2016 film Hidden Figures. There are a couple of other women with tremendous stories that our audience may find interesting today. The first is Dr. Mary Walker. Like me, Dr. Walker was born in upstate New York. She enrolled in the Syracuse Medical College and got her medical degree in 1855. This was a time when many colleges did not accept women at all. During the Civil War, she served as a contract surgeon and was awarded the Medal of Honor for, for that service. That medal was later rescinded and then restored. She was a pioneer in women's rights, including the women's right to dress as she pleased. In this case, Dr. Walker found wearing pants to be comfortable, practical, and controversial. She unfortunately passed away only three months before the 19th Amendment became law. Her story is both unusual and inspirational. The second is Miss Julia Ward. She was born in 1900 and earned her bachelor's degree and doctorate from Bryn Mawr College. She joined the Signal Security Agency as a librarian in World War II and became the deputy chief of that organization. She later served both in the Armed Forces Security Agency and in the early days of the National Security Agency. She was inducted into the Cryptologic Hall of Honor in 2002. Despite these accomplishments and million, of these women and millions of others since the passage of the 19th Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment remains controversial. It is a sign to me that as a nation, there are still important conversations and decisions ahead. I appreciate the invitation to participate in such a distinguished panel today, and I look forward to the questions. Well, thanks, thanks, Ms. Miller. That's pretty. That's an inspiring story, and I suspect will elicit a number of questions from our audience. I would comment to your about uh, Dr. Mary Walker, the only woman to have received the the nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. AUSA probably has just uh, uh, published a, a graphic novel telling her story uh, that'll soon be available on the AUSA website, and we encourage you to access that as well. So thanks, Ms. Miller. And next up, General Richardson from U.S. Army North. General Richardson, please. Participate in today's panel with Kathy Miller, who I've known for many years, uh, Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, who I served with at Force Com, and also Command Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel. So, sir, General Ham and AUSA, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with AUSA in such an interactive and engaging forum. I enjoyed participating in last month's Thought Leader Series, and I look forward to our discussion today. The motto of U.S. Army North is strength of the nation. These words encapsulate our essence and get to the heart of our mission, which is to detect, deter, and defeat threats to our homeland. We conduct event defense support of civil authorities and execute cooperation initiatives with Canada and Mexico to defend the United States and its interests. But what gives us our strength? What gives us the ability to accomplish this varied mission set and bolster America? In a word, I would argue it's diversity. While women comprise only one facet of our diverse organization, I'll focus my brief remarks on this demographic. This, after all, is a discussion with and about Army women. Today, women have more opportunities than ever. Approximately 18% of the total Army is female, and all of the positions in the Army are now open to women. That was not the case when I entered the service, but still more work remains. 100 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, a majority of Americans say the country has not gone far enough in giving women equal rights with men. While this is a worrisome statistic, the Army, on the other hand, 
wants female soldiers assigned to positions that provide full and challenging career and promotion opportunities. We know from history and experience that the contributions and achievements of women make our Army stronger. As Army Chief of Staff General McConville says, people first, winning matters. So how do women in the Army maximize their potential and win? Let me offer you my thoughts, which apply both to men and women. Be competent, learn all you can about your unit and your command, about your job, and about your Army. Be fit mentally, spiritually, and physically, and be competitive because winning matters. We cannot afford any weak links in our organization. The Army is a team sport, and we need everyone on the team to be successful. As I said, women, winning matters. Set the example, show your organization what right looks like. That's how we empower the next generation of leaders. Keep in mind, though, that listening is just as important as leading. Take the time to meet with your people and your organization, whether in person or virtually. The Army is about people, not planes and ships. And in order to be a great organization, you have to know your people. It's like a winning sports team. You have to know your people and tap into each of their strengths and improve their weaknesses. The final thing I would offer is to find a mentor and to be a mentor. And mentorship doesn't need to be a formal process. And a mentor can be anyone, even and especially a member of the opposite sex. For example, my husband has been a mentor to me since I was a lieutenant. He's a couple years older than me, and we have come up through the ranks together. Also, my commanders throughout my career have all been men. But they were also mentors to me throughout my career. Bottom line, if you're a leader, you're a mentor. I'm confident that if you apply these tidbits of advice, all will maximize your potential, your team's potential, and win. Sir, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I look forward to questions at the end. Well, thanks very much, General Richardson. And if you had any doubt about uh, General Richardson's background in winning, she was an All-American collegiate athlete. So she came to the Army with a winning attitude and has continued that, uh, that throughout, uh, to be sure. Uh, her, as she mentioned, she spoke with AUSA on the Thought Leaders Program, principally about U.S. Army North's role in, in, uh, in combating the coronavirus. I encourage you to go to the archives in our, on our website and take a look at that. It's, a, it's amazing all that the Army has done uh, principally under General Richardson's leadership in that regard. And I know that she and her team are, uh, are, are at full alert now with tropical storms and potentially hurricanes uh, approaching the continental United States. Thank you, General Richardson. We'll turn now to Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, the Chief of Army Reserve and the Commanding General of Army Reserve Command. General Daniels, welcome. So thank you, General Ham. It's, it's great to be here today. Uh, even if we are all virtually set apart, um, it's such a great audience to be participating with us. And then it's uh, really nice to have such an accomplished group of leaders, Ms. Kathleen Miller, Lieutenant General R Laura Richardson, and Command Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel. It's, it's a privilege to be amongst this crowd. Um, second, my, my thanks and appreciation to AUSA for inviting me to participate in the panel discussion today with such a distinguished group. So I'm gonna take a slightly different tact. Um, and so I believe that my path to success, again, can be traced back to mentors, as was mentioned by General Richardson. Um, those folks who took some time to encourage me to take a path that I might not have otherwise followed. One said to me, you should go to graduate school. And that had never been on my radar scope. Another said, you know, you can't make general officer if you don't apply and go to the war college. The fact that someone was even thinking I could be a general officer was, was um, hit me in a couple of different ways and clearly had not been on my radar scope either. But both comments encouraged me to take a path and to pursue a path that I hadn't considered. And I believe that that's how we can empower the next generation of female and male leaders. We must continue to counsel and encourage our young women and men to take advantage of personal and professional development opportunities that they may not have thought of otherwise. And so my advice to a young female who has just joined the Army, whether in any component, 
is to consider where you want to be two positions beyond now. That may seem like it's a far way off, but, but it's really, really not. Um, just like my mentors did for me, ask your leadership for their thoughts. Going to graduate school and war college and then making general each a few positions away from where I was and the advice at council that I received. But I needed to do something to have those paths even be possible to me. And then as you think about these various possibilities and options, examine what education or training you might need to get there. Then go make it happen. Take the tough jobs, the stretch positions, and then go do the hard work and make the most of every opportunity. In terms of how the Army has evolved throughout my career, I would note that our approach to diversity continues to improve and recognize the value of varying perspectives and styles. My career path is one not typically considered as, as a traditional path. I've held positions in intelligence, civil affairs, and in training. I think that helped me to see things from a variety of different perspectives. I also think that this diversity of paths, along with having to be successful in a civilian career, with its own unique set of leadership styles, allows for more female voices to be heard and to be successful. Um, this goes to the overall Army principle of treating one another with dignity and respect at all times, and also to my vision for the Army Reserve, which is that I want to foster a mindset of teamwork, continuous learning, and growth so that our soldiers desire to continue to serve and lead. This is especially important as we look to retain and develop our junior leaders, whether officer, enlisted, or warrant officers, so they can become the mid-grade and senior leaders of tomorrow, both in their military and civilian careers. So thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in today's panel. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thanks, General Daniels. Um, I, I do remember uh, the day that uh, we pinned that first star on you, and no one in that room and no one who's ever served with you had any doubt that you were the right person to serve as a as an army general officer. Uh, it was a it was a that was a good day, and your service has continued to be extraordinary. Um, like you are the first woman to serve as chief of army reserve, and like our other uh, speakers today, each of whom has also been the first woman to serve in in particular positions. I suspect there may be some more questions about that that ground the groundbreaking nature of those kinds of of assignments. So we turn now, you know, we've had, we've heard from the Army's most senior career civilian, uh, Ms. Miller. We've heard from two general officers, uh, but those who have been in and around the Army know if you really want to get stuff done, you turn to a Command Sergeant Major. And so uh, we're, we're very honored to have Command Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel with us, uh, the Command Sergeant Major of Army uh, Human Resources Command at Fort Knox. Sergeant Major, welcome. Thank you, sir. Greetings from uh, the Mod Complex at Fort Knox the home of the Human Resources Command. Thank you, AUSA, and for hosting this forum. And thank you for the invitation to join you today to be a member of the panel with such esteemed leaders. It's really nice being here today, especially on the occasion of women's equality and the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. What a day to be, great day to be in the Army. I will tell you, I'm very humbled and honored to be here today. I wanted to start off by sharing a little story about me and how this all began being in, in, in boots. Um, 30 years ago, I was a college student who lost academic focus and my passion to be a student. And I decided I wasn't going back to college and my plan was unknown to my parents. So I know I had to come up with something very quick <laughs> and, and fast and in a hurry. And so what I did is within a couple of weeks, I was on my way to basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And since joining the Army, I can honestly say, being a soldier has really been my greatest passion. A lot of times I often get asked, well, how do you get there? You know, I get asked by both male and females, what, what is the secret to becoming a Sergeant Major? I say, well, um, you know, if I had a magic ball, I would tell you I used that. But the truth was, is, is it, it was a lot of hard work. But my path really included that I had a great support system and foundation um, at home and everywhere I went in, in my journey through this military career. I knew that I had to be focused, more focused than who I was when I was in college. And so I had to make this go well. So I was focused, I set goals early, and I used these things that was available to me, like my career map to kind of help charter and kind of uh, help my path to get into where I, where I knew I had to hit all those gates that I had to hit along the way. 
and having an um, informed conversation with my career manager help. How, how does it come full circle? Now I'm here at HRC where all the career managers are. So uh, it really does come full circle. But my desire was really to pursue those challenging positions um, in my career field to set myself apart from other uh, others, my peers, um, and do my best on whatever I was to do. And one thing I also understood that I had to have a strong leadership foundation. And I was able to gain that experience and that knowledge through being a drill sergeant, a first sergeant, and command sergeant major at, at all levels. And also watching leaders around me and what they did. So who I am as a leader today, I wouldn't, I'll tell you, it, it was a village that helped me to really be where I'm at and, and also provide those opportunities for me to have. Being a senior leader is um, comes with a responsibility. I also understand that. And with that uh, responsibility, I know I have to share my knowledge and experience with all soldiers and give them that, um, that advice that I will give anyone, whether it's female or like. And those things will be, be fearless. Try things and try new things. And if you fail, that's okay. It's about getting back up and, and trying it again. Invest in yourself. Know your craft and whatever you do, do it well and know you matter. You have a voice that counts and you're not alone. So as we are women in the uniform, I know that it's once it was long before we was here. Women who have served in countries since the Revolutionary War. And it's no denying that women's contributions and impact across the Army and society is evident. It's evident in in many ways, and it shows today that the ties are turning as we have the distinguished accomplishments of the panel members that are with us today and the integration of women in combat arms uh, career fields. I will empower women of the next generation as I would alike with all soldiers coming in by building trust and encouraging them to be part of a process of growing the army as a place where we all can get fair opportunities to serve and grow. I will also share my story with them, whether good or bad and not all good. So hopefully they can learn a little bit from my mistakes and I will most of all keep them the encouraged. We stand on the shoulders of the past successes of Army women. And I stand on the shoulders of ones here on the panel with me who served before us and who continue to serve. We must continue to carry the torch we must continue to show the um, disbelievers with determination we can rise to the challenge. I know with hard work and together, we will continue to have the success in the future. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Command Sergeant Major. That's, that's uh, for those inspiring words. And I gotta tell you, as, you're, as you were speaking, what ran through my head was who better uh, to be the Command Sergeant Major of Human Resources Command at such a critical time for the Army uh, than, than you and your experience. And I think you've encapsulated that uh, quite effectively as you and your, your team have Army-wide impact uh, supporting the Chief's uh, emphasis on people first. So thank you uh, for your words and thank you more for all that you have done and will continue to do. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes, so we'll turn to some uh, questions for our speakers today. And Ms. Miller, if we could, if I could uh, start with you, you, as you mentioned in your remarks, you've worked in a, in a wide variety of offices and, and uh, departments and, and agencies. That's a little bit unusual because sometimes Army civilians tend to stay in, in, a, in a, a, a fairly standard array of positions. How do you think that diversity of, of, uh, of professional experiences has helped you and which ones were most influential in, in your development? Oh goodness, that, the most influential probably is the hardest question. Um, Army civilians do tend to stay inside our technical lanes through the GS grades. It isn't hard, it is very hard to jump between functional areas in the GS. My opportunities have come since I've become a senior executive and I've had mentors who have trusted in me to move me into different places. So um, as we look at the mission set for the assistant secretary or for the um, 
I'm an assistant to the Secretary of the Army, I would say that all of the experiences I've had as an executive come into play. My experience both at the IRS and in the Army's budget office in resource management comes into play because we handle the budget activities for the whole headquarters. All of the, ex the six years I spent um, in the Army's G4 with three marvelous leaders, starting with Mitch Stevenson and going on to Ray Mason and then with Gus Perna, taught me tremendous amounts about the logistics capacity of our Army. And in this particular uh, position, we have to manage the facilities, property books, um, and any number of other logistics kinds of support operations for the headquarters. And then finally, uh, Joe Anderson believed in me and mentored me and brought me in to be his deputy in the Army's G3. And I learned an awful lot about what our Army does operationally and how we support those operations. And more importantly, maybe about IT and some of the cybersecurity issues that we face today. So all of those skills are things that I use every day um, it, as the as the AA for the headquarters department of the Army. And I couldn't be here without the support and belief of those mentors who saw something in me that was worth nurturing and growing and believing in. And so I want to make sure I pass on the thanks there. No, oh, thanks, Ms. Miller. And uh, General Richardson, if I could turn to you, you mentioned in your remarks and your, your uh, uh, recommendation to all to both seek out a mentor and to, and to be a mentor. And, and you, you mentioned uh, your spouse, you, you are in a, a dual military couple, uh, as are many who are tuned in to our, uh, our, our event today. Can you talk a little bit, General Richardson, about some of the challenges encountered of being a dual military family and what has that allowed you to do? What has that created a particular challenges for you in your professional development? So thank you for that question, and uh, and um, quite honestly, to be a dual military couple is um, uh, it it has been a challenge, but it's been very rewarding at the same time. And so, quite honestly, there was a lot of give and take as uh, as Jim and I were coming up through the ranks and and trying to get all the jobs that we were supposed to have. Um, we're also both helicopter pilots, so there are certain. Um, things that we need to maintain throughout our career and achieve as aviators in order to continue uh, in aviation branch and as pilots. And so quite honestly, there was always give and take. Sometimes I had to, I had to follow Jim to assignments, which was fine. And then other times he had to follow me to assignments, um, depending on if it was uh, generally uh, whoever was lead, it was because it was, um, it was needed for career progression. But uh, in the end, I would tell you, sir, that quite honestly, I think that because of the give and take and the different positions that we had as we were coming up actually um, made us to uh, our, our careers, our career path to have a different have different tools in our kit bag because we weren't just like the typical aviator doing the typical aviator things. We actually added, uh, ended up with two, three, four different skill sets. Um, because of having to follow one another at different periods in our in our um, in our uh, coming up through the career, so I think that in the end, the um, don't be worried about that. You always have to you always have to be trying to achieve and be the lead uh, as a dual military couple. It actually, in my in my opinion, works out in the end. Just do your best when you get a job that you don't think is that that uh, important. You know, because every job in the Army is important. It's what you put into that position while you're in it. Uh, and because I had a couple of those positions that, that you know, um, that I didn't think were that, uh, that important, but I did my best in them while I was in them. And uh, quite honestly, you learn in everything that you do. And so uh, my recommendation would be just to, uh, you got to try hard, though, to stay together. Um, don't ask for things that will uh, for sure split you apart because the Army does a great job keeping dual military couples together. Uh, and so you got to put thought into it about a year out before a PCS. Uh, and you have to, and if you have children, the same thing. You got to start thinking a year out where you want to go, where you both can go to stay together, keep your family together, and then uh, all, the, all the things that are there in the installation for both of you to do. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those insights. I suspect there are 
there are many service members, many soldiers uh, who are dual military who would benefit uh, uh, by your experience and, and your mentoring as you as you move forward. I also, uh, uh, as you talked about, you know, sometimes you you get assigned to a, a a position that maybe wasn't real high on your on your wish list, and and I've found that it oftentimes going to a position like that is the position where you learn the most uh, and have to grow the most. So that's, I think, your advice to, you know, uh, serve where you're called and do the best you can and learn the most you can is uh, very prescient and very appropriate uh, uh, for each and every one of us. Uh, General Daniels, as, as mentioned, you, you are the first woman to serve as the Chief of, of Army Reserve. If you could talk a little bit about uh, about whether that brings any added pressure or sense of responsibility. And if you would also uh, talk a bit about the challenges of the Army Reserve, where the expectation is not only that you uh, display great professionalism and expertise as a soldier, but also have to be successful in your civilian career. And how do you balance those uh, two sometimes competing requirements? So while I'm, you know, the first female in this particular position, you know, it means that I've opened a door um, just like the others before me who have opened other doors, such as Vice Admiral Robin Braun, who was the first chief of Naval Reserve some, you know, eight years ago when she got that position. So they've opened doors so that others and I've opened a door now that others may be able to follow through. So and that, you know, I can help them open other doors that are not yet open. So that's that's how I sort of view this. It's just I'm one in a series and we'll continue to open up, keep opening up those doors. In terms of having the military and the civilian position and the challenges, um, how do you how do you keep those dual careers going at the same time? I would say that time management is key. Um, and email management is vital. You can let it suck away your entire life or you can or you can manage it and control it and help it be a part of your daily battle rhythm. Um, another key to all of this is communication with both employers, making sure that each one is aware of what your requirements are and how you're trying to manage them and help balance them, keeping all those bosses appraised of where you're headed, what you're doing, what kind of constraints you have, so that they each can manage expectations of, of their projects that they need you to accomplish. If you don't have that communication going, you're, you're gonna have a, a bit of a challenge keeping everyone uh, happy with where you are. So communication, 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 I think is, is vital to being able to succeed and able to have that healthy dual civil military career progression, and, you know, as long as you're trying to also have that, that meaningful service. So I would say the other challenge that I've sort of experienced is uh, leadership from a distance. So my first brigade command had units in four different states, which wasn't horribly painful, but it was a little tricky. And then my next command position had uh, 11 units in nine different states. And even if they were two in the same state, they weren't near each other at all. So I had to figure out how to get around to all those people, how to communicate with those subordinates and keep them apprised of where they stood, what was going on in their formations. So whether it was email, phone calls, texting, other forms, keeping that communication up and going was sort of important uh, in, in, in all of my different aspects of careers. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there's an old saying at the Army Reserve that the sun never sets on the Army Reserve as you have uh, soldiers and civilians stationed around the globe uh, each and every day. So your command now truly is uh, a global enterprise. So expanding on uh, what you've learned at the uh, at the regional level, the, the, the expanded national level, and now truly global uh, is a challenge. Uh, Command Star Major Thorpe Noel, if I could turn to you now as the as the CSM at uh, Human Resources Command, could you talk a little bit about how you how you have seen uh, recruiting, accessions, and assignment and professional development of women change over the course of your career? Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it has changed quite a bit. Um, it's, it's been that thing about um, continue to be work in progress. I definitely saw that we have changed since I've uh, been in, I mean, and seeing women more 
than I have ever. When I first came in the military, I didn't see many women that looked like me or just women, period, um, in leadership positions. Um, and I started off at Fort Stewart, Georgia, in my first assignment, and I didn't see that. Um, I did see some E7s here and there, but I just didn't get the opportunity to see as many. But as the longer I stayed in, the more I was able to see more female leaders um, in our formations. And I will tell you, um, it became more, it, 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 it makes a difference. It makes a difference to be able to see someone that's um, like you, to be able to do those things and be in those leadership positions. And, I, and it's exciting to see that. Even more than ever today, we have um, females in um, leadership positions at all levels serving and serving with um, greatness across all our formations. And I'm very proud of that. But I know the impact and I know the contributions that we bring to the, um, the Army across the entire Army, and I'm grateful for that. You will see that with the sessions and with the number of soldiers that came in just two years ago, the numbers is a 3,000 3, increase since two years ago with the number of women that are serving in our army. So that tells you right there that it's just work in progress, that we are evolving and going in the right direction. I know this. And I can tell by just the panel members here and just, just being around. That is the business that we are in, is managing the talent and making sure that we have the right soldier at the right place at the right time and the best athlete. We are really finding our way to be able to know that all combat arms is open to all the female. Uh, combat arm um, um, career fields are open to all females now, and they are doing well. All we needed was just the opportunity to have an opportunity to do the job. And I think also what I would say is this. I will close with this. I think it's about a mindset. It's about a mindset and being willing to be that one to say, hey, I'm going to give them an opportunity because they deserve it. Thanks. So, Sergeant Major, if I could uh, pull on one string there, you are also a very senior uh, woman of color uh, in the Army. And, and any particular challenges that you've encountered in, th in that regard, uh, and any comments about, you know, the Army is uh, obviously engaged in a in a discussion and actions about race and inclusiveness uh, in the Army today. But from your perspective, any any comments in that regard? Um, yes, sir. I, um, I experience um, other people biases and stereotypes. I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't deny that because um, I sometimes maybe I thought it may have been because of color. Maybe it might have been because of my perception that it might have been because of uh, uh, me being a female. I'm not absolutely sure of it. And to be honest with you, I didn't let that be an obstacle for me. I let them, that be their responsibility, how they have to mitigate through that and to do that. For me, I was going to continue to give all I have and do the best that whatever I'm doing, I'm going to do well at it and give all I have to give. I wasn't going to let any barriers or someone else's biases or stereotypes be my responsibility that I have to, I have to work through. Now, it does catch your attention. Because sometimes, you know, I would be faced with dealing with someone thinking one thing as far as a particular stereotype from a, 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 a black female, when the truth is I didn't do no more or less than the one that's right beside me. And it's not a problem. But the truth is I just, I just felt that the best course of action for me to do was just stay the course and, and move forward and do well or whatever I've done. I cannot control, um, I learned that real early. I cannot control um, what they want the narrative to be, but I can't control mine. And what I want others that's falling behind me to be able to know. I don't deny that it's probably there and I don't deny any of that, but I just didn't make that my, my responsibility. Thanks, Sergeant Major. That's that's pretty powerful. Thank you very, very much. We've got uh, just a couple of minutes uh, remaining. So what I thought we would do is ask each of our speakers uh, to speak a bit about mentorship, because that's been a bit of a of a common theme. And if each of you would 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 talk just for a few moments about uh, so, uh, someone who's been a particularly effective mentor for you, 
uh, or a particularly rewarding mentoring experience that you had mentoring someone else. And so while General Daniels, General Richardson, and Sergeant Major get to think about it, Ms. Miller, you don't. Oh. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna come to you first, please. Well, General Hand, th thanks for the question. Um, let's start with the folks that I've mentored. I'm, I'm actually also a certified organization coach. And so I have a, a number of folks that I've had a coaching relationship with for several years, colleagues, um, more junior employees and so forth. And I wanna protect their confidentiality, but I think I can tell a story about one particular person who happens to be a woman of color, exceptionally bright, with a, a lot of um, important people that are willing to mentor and show this person, uh, help this person move forward. Um, what all she needed was someone to kind of listen and coax out her way forward, not other people's way forward. For Army civilians, we have an awful lot of freedom to craft our own careers and being able to um, just sort of hold the space for that person as, as they thought through what they wanted to do three years from now, five years from now. I think um, it was it General Daniels who spoke about the need to look out to where you wanted to be and then take the steps um, to get there, for example, when you take a position, think about where it's going to get you two positions from now. Um, that kind of thought process in uh, what are my options, how do we go forward, uh, is is very, very valuable. And in this case, I've watched this this person grow from, from uh, middle GS ranks to the top of the GS ranks, and I think the sky's the limit for them. Um, for myself, I've been very fortunate to have mentors my whole career. And probably one of the, the biggest impacts on how I thought about the Army and being a civilian in the Army was Mr. Ernie Gregory, who used to be the DASA for financial operations back in the, the 80s and the 90s. He's passed on now, but his way of speaking with people, of making issues and problems real for them and for having the courage to pull you aside and not only tell you the good stuff, but also point out ways um, that, that you were getting in your own way of advancing. I think his mentorship probably had the most impact on my early career and, and set the, the way forward. Good, thanks for that. We've got just a, a few moments left, so if we could go uh, quickly to, to General Richardson, then General Daniels, then Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel. General Richardson. So thanks, General Ham. So in terms of mentorship, um, like I said in my, my opening comments, I think that quite honestly, if you're in a leadership position, uh, and even if you're not, if you're if you're a senior level leader like all of us on this panel, um, you have responsibility to be a mentor. And quite honestly, it doesn't take uh, sitting down for 30 minutes or an hour. It can be something. Um, uh, much shorter than that and just setting the right example and that sort of thing. Um, but I do find that um, obviously as, I, as I'm doing, I'm sitting down with my entire organization with small groups as part of project inclusion and, um, and we go around and we uh, all introduce ourselves, how we grew up, where we grew up, you know, and uh, when you find out more about uh, your people in terms of what they're about, how they came up, was it they had a hard time, you know, as they were growing up, or was it a little bit easier, you know, some of their challenges. I mean, you just get to know people and you talk to people. And quite honestly, you end up talking about careers and, and the army and, and career paths and things like that. And so um, quite honestly, I mean, I could rattle off a whole bunch of mentors. You know, I, I already said my husband, my swimming coaches, my chemistry teacher, um, it was just uh, several commanders. And then sometimes you even learn a lot from people who don't set the right example, right, uh, of what not to do. And so um, anyway, not any particular one, uh, but, uh, but several. And so that, that's what message I would leave with today. Good. Thanks, General Richardson. General Daniels? 
So my first army boss had a tremendous influence on my life. He brought me in, got me assigned where I to Fort Huachuca. I was supposed to go someplace completely different. And he took a great interest in making sure that I had a, a great job and a great experience. And then I was looking that the couple positions out into the future. Without that thought process, I would never end up where I am today. I'm still in touch with him um, and we, we've maintained contact over the years. Um, one tip that I would give on mentorship is to do one up, one down and one peer and to do it weekly, whether it's a text, a call, a Facebook post, an email or just some sort of contact to check in to get to make sure that that person is still on track or may need assistance or may just want to have a call. Just just some quick, quick sort of thing. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Yeah, we often forget about uh, mentorship uh, from from those who might in the army be a junior to us in rank, but that mentorship can be quite powerful. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have quite a few folks that I can say that um, mentor me and some of them didn't even realize they were. It was indirectly probably. Um, they just didn't re realize that they were. So I have a host of people along my way. I can tell you, I got a list that's pretty long. Um, that again, some of it was direct, direct mentorship, and some of it was indirect. They didn't even realize they was mentoring me. Um, I have one particular one. If I had to name one, was a um, uh, my first supervisor um, when I was a young soldier. Um, he was my first. His first name is Mike Depko. Mike Depko uh, was an individual that um, no matter what, he got me out of my way a lot of times. I was uh, always uh, really focused, really excited about doing everything. And uh, he just got me out of my way, understood how to have a conversation with me and settled me down. And he kept the human dimension in it for me. And, and that meant a lot to me, to be able to talk to me like I was somebody and, and let me know I can be any any person I want and be great. And, and that included... Um, care that he gave my family to him and his wife. And I would never forgive that. And that's what I'm trying to continue to pay forward. Um, all those people that, that mentor and poured into me and invested into me, I'm just trying to do the same as, and as, I, as I go forward. Um, so, you know, mentorship to me is, 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 is constant and just continuous. And, and, and I do it a lot of times through building teams. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sergeant Major, and, and thanks to each of the four of you for those uh, uh, for those insights. You know, despite a bit of a technologically rocky start to today, uh, the conversation uh, has really been insightful and enlightening, and I and I hope for all of our audience as well. So, Miss Miller, to you, to General Richardson, General Daniels, Command Sergeant Major Thorpe Noel, thank you very very much. I suspect, I suspect each of the four of you are going to. Uh, find some people knocking on your doors, asking for some more mentorship uh, and some more guidance as we move forward. And for, for everyone who is a leader, as mentioned here, take that responsibility, take that guidance that these four great Army women have suggested to us today uh, as we move forward. A couple of, uh, of uh, events upcoming for AUSA to put on your calendar. A week from today, the 31st of August, join us for a noon report an Army discussion on race with Sergeant Major of the Army Michael Grinston and a group of Army squad leaders to get their perspective uh, with the SMA. On September 2nd, we'll have a noon report again following on an Army discussion of race with uh, Lieutenant General Darrell Williams, Superintendent of the Military Academy at West Point, Major General John Evans, Commanding General of Cadet Command, uh, Sergeant Major Sellers, at Headquarters Department of the Army, G4, your old stomping ground, Miss mm -hmm. Miller, uh, and Sergeant Major Julie Guerra, Sergeant Major of Army, G2. And on 14th September, we have a noon report with the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ramon C.Z. Colon Lopez. So please join us for each of those events. You can get more information and register at the AUSA website, ausa.org. And lastly, for those of you who are AUSA members, thank you so much. Frankly, we can't do events like this without your membership. If you're watching in today and you're not an AUSA member, go right now to AUSA.org and become a member to support the Army, support soldiers, their families, veterans, retirees, and the great businesses that support America's Army. 
But thank you, each of the four of you, for today for a great presentation. Thank all of you for tuning in today and staying with us, and I hope you have a great Army Day.